Actually, Mr. Tierman is a, an economist by training. He does hedge funds, but what we have in, uh, in common is that he goes after the evil ones with a vengeance. His special pet peeve is the oligarchs, which means he has a death wish. I just go after secret police, and not all secret policemen are oligarchs, whereas all oligarchs are connected, at least in post-Soviet Russia, to the secret police. So he has a distinct death wish. Uh, everybody, or almost everybody who's interested in anything Polish knows his father. His father was an equal opportunity hater. He hated the Nazis and he hated the communists. That's pretty much like and, we the, and the New York liberals. And the New York liberals. That's pretty much exhaust the list, the hit list that all decent people ought to share. Um, uh, Matthew Termond runs with an outfit called American Transparency, uh, but he also dips into Polish things. So I like that very much, and I'm sure he'll tell you more about it. He's a very entertaining person. Well, we'll be the judge of that in a few minutes, I guess. Thank you for the introduction. It's great to be here at an esteemed institution of higher education and thought. Uh, Kuba Wojewódzki, who intimated a few months ago in Politica that I am nothing but a gadfly, would not approve of this engagement. Uh, I have been engaged in the Polish, I guess, public debate for the last two to three years. I started going to Poland five years ago, uh, almost on a lark. Obviously, I have a very long and I guess somewhat esteemed family history of intellectual engagement with Poland. Uh, and I started going, I actually uh, dovetailing on Professor Uncle Chris. Uh, I first went to Poland one week before Smolensk. That was the first time I was there. Uh, and I stayed out of the, the public debate for the first couple of years. I, I went around the country and I got to know it and I fell in love with it and I got citizenship. And it was very smart, I think, that I got citizenship before I ever opened my mouth. Because with the VIP treatment, it took about 15 months. I can't imagine what the paperwork would look like right now. Uh, in 2013, and I have, as uh, Professor Horakiewicz uh, alluded to, my background is in Wall Street. I spent my 20s uh, investing, uh, working with hedge funds, uh, and doing uh, economic analysis, both macro and micro. And the first time I engaged the public debate in Poland was when the last government announced that they would be nationalizing the pension system. Uh, the OFA, OFA pensions. And this was, uh, this was a very big motivating factor for me to get involved and start really attacking. And I wrote, uh, I wrote some, uh, some stuff for ONET and for Forbes, and I actually uh, worked with Balcharovich a little uh, on this subject, because I thought that this was an incredible abrogation of rule of law. Uh, and it showed, and I'll talk a little bit more about the reasoning behind it and the implications of it, but it showed the level of venality that this last Polish government was willing to commit to, to further cement and entrench their power. Uh, and that was the first thing. And then it was uh, like Dostoevsky wrote in the Brothers Karamazov about peeling an onion. And as you peel the onion, there's always so much more depth and richness and many things that will make you cry. Uh, so I got really engaged pretty quickly after the OFA nationalization, and I endorsed Yaroslav Govin, who had broken away to form a new political party, uh, and that kind of put me a little bit into the public debate and gave me a little bit of a platform, and that's when I started also writing uh, on a more formal basis. I started writing for Super Express, which is ironic because it's a tabloid, but what I learned was that if you wanted to write the truth in the Polish media, you had to write for a tabloid. Uh, and that's a really a scary dynamic, but one that I will outline as I deconstruct the Polish media complex. Uh, that is uh, certainly my version of the truth, but when you go to the editorial page of a tabloid, you see a plurality of viewpoints. When you go to a mainstream press organ in Poland, whether it's uh, on TV or whether it's in print, uh, it is very, very homogenous in viewpoints. Uh, and obviously, Professor Uncle Chris mentioned uh, Gazette of Aborcia, that's been, uh, that will factor in heavily into this sort of deconstruction. Uh, 
Also, by way of background, uh, after I left Wall Street, I joined another Polish-American who likes to fight, a guy named Adam Andrzejewski. He ran for governor in Illinois in 2010 on a very single unilateral platform, which was forensic auditing the state of Illinois. Needless to say, this did not resonate with the political class. <laughs> So he actually, uh, interestingly enough, also uh, a little bit of a claim to fame uh, is that he brought Lech Fuenza to come stump for him. And this was the first time that Lech Fuenza endorsed a foreign candidate on their home turf. And this was in 2010. And to give an example, what we all know, I think, especially in this room about the media complex, uh, is that they have a lot of mechanisms in which they try and drive the agenda. So in Chicago, where you have this massive population of Poles, obviously, but also Lithuanians and Estonians and Hungarians and Czech and Slovaks. And so all these Central and Eastern European uh, ethnicities and national backgrounds that really fought, uh, fought communism. And Lech Wałęsa was a great symbol. The Chicago Tribune did not even run a story on Lech Wałęsa coming to Chicago to stump for Adam Andrzejewski because they knew that this had the ability to galvanize a bit of a crossover electorate. Uh, with Chicago, you've got the right of center Central Europeans, and you've got the left of center, which is very strong Democratic Union, uh, union voters. And Adam, with Lech Wałęsa there, would have had the power to galvanize a bit of a crossover, which is very unparalleled and very, uh, very unique in Illinois. And so the Tribune saw that as a threat, so they never even mentioned which I think is really incredible. But we could talk about the US media on many a symposium. We're here to talk about the Polish media. Uh, so what I really want to drill down on is in the last six to eight years, this evolution of the Polish mainstream media becoming a collusionary partner, a partner in practice with the incumbent governments to drive the narrative, to drive the agenda, and to stump for one class of politicians, uh, as I not so affectionately refer to them, their guys. And the entire media complex is built around this. And there are multiple mechanisms they utilize to help craft this narrative and to move their game plan forward. And I'm going to go through several of them. And I just want to start by reading the First Amendment of the United States Constitution because I think it's very important. I believe in, in American constitutional Republican exceptionalism, that the American Constitution was the greatest codification of rule of law in the history of the world. It's why America has been a world, a global leader for 250 years in driving prosperity and innovation. And the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. This amendment, there's a reason it's the first amendment, is the predicate of which a free society is based. I personally believe that the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, is the secondary predicate. It protects the First Amendment. In Poland, there, and that's a whole other debate, in Poland there, is, there has not been any codification to this standard of protection of free expression. Not in the 1791 Constitution, not in the Constitution made 25, 26 years ago in 1989 after the Round Table. There's never been this level of protection. Now, I, ironically, or maybe somewhat appropriately, I would think that the idea of the right to petition the government for redress of grievances is so incredibly Polish. You are being encouraged by constitutional fiat to complain. I can't think of anything that is more perfectly in sync with the Polish zeitgeist. So with no codification, uh, in 1791 or 1989, and post the round table, where the fighters for freedom, exemplified by Solidarność and Lech Wałęsa and the communist opposition that had been fighting uh, for the better part of the decade, uh, got together with those who ruled, with the, what I refer to as the worst people Poland's ever had. Uh, and unfortunately, many of them are still with us. And in that period of getting together 
uh, to create a new constitution, from the very beginning, it was not going to be this level of codified protection of free rights and human rights, because you had the people who were the oppressors getting together with the fighters and compromising. And so from the very beginning, there's a flaw in this. And I often talk about free speech and free expression in Poland and how necessary it is, because Poles are very independent-minded after so many centuries of oppression at the hands of Russia and Soviet Union and Prussia and Austro-Hungary, uh, that Poles have developed culturally, and you can see it in the entrepreneurial ethos and spirit of the Polish people, that despite all of the, the problems the government creates for them, they still are capable of creating, as uh, one of my favorite Polish politicians says, uh, Jarosław Govin, 70% of Polish GDP is generated from the fact that it's a nation of shopkeepers. So despite all of the bureaucracies that many of which are holdovers of the communist system, things like Zykes, which is the union of, entrepreneur, union of artists that steals a little bit of royalties to quote unquote protect the artist. Despite all of these things stacked against Polish citizenry, they still create, they still innovate, they still provide for themselves and their families. And I think that's incredible. And I think that the next step for Poland is an embracing of this level of First Amendment, American style First Amendment, engagement in protecting free expression in all its forms. Now, the logical, evolution of not having this protection is that you create these perverse incentives. And that's what we've seen in this media collusion. As a result of these elitist mechanisms that come from the halls of government and the halls of academia and the halls of the largest media complexes, there's a hostility to debate and there are mechanisms in place that stifle debate. And I'm going to talk about several of them. The one that really bothers me the most on an institutional legal protection level is the idea that any public official can sue a private citizen for defamation in the course of public criticism. Now, obviously, co-running a good government group in Illinois, the Super Bowl of Corruption, I believe that an engaged citizenry uh, is not only encouraged, but obligated to fight with criticism, with words. That is how you keep the political class honest. And I'm also in this, in this uh, deconstruction lecture, I'm going to talk a lot about personal experience of what I've come up against in the Polish system, because it, I think there's nothing as instructive as anecdotal evidence. Uh, and especially some of these anecdotes, you can see they're not an island unto themselves. They're very much scaled up in practice by the Polish government and the Polish media complex. So this most pernicious example uh, of which criticism, especially that of visible public figures, is stifled by the civil justice system through arbitrary or loose definitions of defamation, libel, and slander, is toxic to democracy. When the elected and appointed political class engages in this reprehensible practice, an integral component of an engaged citizenry is neutered, and that's the ability to, to hold the political class accountable. The way of deflection that the political class utilizes uh, in never defending their actions to the engaged citizenry is that it severs open and honest debate. And that's certainly what we see in Poland. Political criticism is not absolutely protected. And you cannot publicly call out and thus catalyze robust investigation, which is what's needed. Because the defamation laws protect many of the worst figures from actually having to be called out in public. And it's a, it's a cudgel that a powerful class utilizes to entrench their power. And for most citizens, they do not have the wherewithal to go and fight a defamation suit, whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's reputational damage, whether it's business damage, all of these are the, the first and second derivative outcomes that come from calling out a politician in Poland, especially over the last decade. Now, where most citizens do not have this wherewithal, I do. And I am going to talk about an example where I called out a member of the political class. So there was one uh, foreign minister of Poland, some of you may be familiar with his body of work. His name is Radosław Sikorski. Uh, it used to be Radosław Sikorski, but after multiple scandals, he started to uh, refer to himself in the uh, affectionate diminutive of Radek to uh, be a little bit more closer to the people. Uh, 
In January of last year, Vaprost, and in full disclosure, I write for Vaprost, and I write for Vaprost because I believe what Vaprost has stood for over the last year in calling out politicians is an integral component in taking Poland back from a class of people like Radosław Sikorski, who have looted the country, as I'm about to go into. Uh, in January of last year, Vaprost wrote a story about Radosław Sikorski paying one of his good friends, a guy named Charles Crawford, who is the former UK ambassador to Poland, uh, whose term had been up several years ago, but there was a very strong personal relationship there. He was paying him 20,000 zloty to proofread each of almost 20 speeches. So 400,000 zloty for proofreading. This was not speech writing, this was proofreading. Now, when anyone who's familiar with Radosław Sikorski's body of work knows that he will never let you forget about his Oxbridge pedigree. He went to Oxford, he's very proud of his English, he's very proud of his, uh, his almost aristocratic communication skills. Uh, when you layer on that he's married to a English-speaking journalist named Anne Applebaum, and that he has a staff in MSZ uh, that has grown continually over the last 10 years, all who have a prerequisite of speaking English, you start to ask yourself, where is the, uh, the mentality of somebody who would pay a close friend of his roughly 1,000 times the market rate of proofreading for his speeches? So 400,000 zloty went from the treasury into his friend's pocket. There was no competitive bidding. There was no procurement process. And so I wrote on January when I, it was a Repros releases their next day cover on Sunday night. So I saw it and I, I, I typed out a little Facebook blurb and I said, this is what fraud looks like. And I felt somewhat, uh, I felt like I had the right to do so, not only as a free citizen, I believe every citizen has the right to do so, and to use the word fraud, uh, to, you, to throw it around actually very aggressively. And Poland fraud is the end-all be-all. If you say fraud, you're inviting a defamation suit. But fraud is a, it is not a perfectly delineated term. Fraud can be in the eyes of the beholder. There's a lot of, uh, of gray area, nebulousness in what fraud is. So as somebody who co-runs a think tank focused on government spending, again, based in Illinois, Illinois. Uh, to me, when I said this is what fraud looks like, I felt very, uh, very sure of myself that I was, uh, those are words I could own. And I woke up on Monday, January 5th to Twitter ablaze because Onet had this as their top story that day. Sikors Tierman calls Sikorsky fraud. Uh, it must have been a really slow news day for this to be the top story on Onet. And when I woke up and Twitter was abuzz, a lot of my friends were calling and emailing and saying, Gertik is saying he's going to be serving you and you're going to be sued. And when I read the tweets that he issued as a clarion call to sue me for defamation, he called it hate speech. He said, this hate speech will not stand. Now, personally, as a civil libertarian and a believer that free speech is the end-all be-all of free society, free expression in every one of its manifold ways is what makes a society free or not, uh, I don't think there's anything that exists that can be termed hate speech. I think hate speech is great speech. All speech is protected speech. There's no such thing as hate speech. I'm a firm believer in the, f in, uh, the famous case in Skokie, Illinois, 1979. Neo-Nazis went through a Jewish neighborhood holding up banners. And you know what? I thought that's great because education and combating and public debate and discourse in the battle of ideas, that's how you vanquish evil, not by making things you don't agree with illegal. But as it, it dawned on me, and as I was busy attacking Gertick and Skorsky on Twitter, which I did for about six hours straight, uh, and it was, it actually, thanks to uh, uh, the alternative media in Poland, it really got thrown out there through uh, outlets like TV Republika and Jezja Lezna, the Politice, uh, some of the online platforms that have been able to fight because the barriers to entry were so much lower in dispersing information. Uh, it dawned on me that there was no case here. I wrote a statement that A, I could defend. I would love to go to court, and I said this to Gertig, well, let's pick a date. Uh, you want to do it in New York, you want to do it in Warsaw, let's go to court, let's discuss what's hate speech, let's discuss procurement law, let's discuss government spending, all, all debates that I think would be great to have in a court of law to get more visibility to these, these really important issues. But it dawned on me that this was a cudgel 
There was no intent to actually bring me to court. It was a threat to try and shut me up. And he hadn't obviously seen my body of work because he would have known that wasn't a prudent game plan. Uh, and my, and he, had, he has a long history, Roman Gertig, the irony is that he was the education minister. So there's something Orwellian in that. Uh, he was deputy prime minister in an uh, early iteration of the PO government. Uh, and yes. Yeah, well, there, there, there's, there's a, you're right, there's a, lo there's a, there's a lot of uh, back and forth in the last eight years. Yeah, These, uh, gone over the other yeah uh, as had Sikorsky, uh, as has uh, Govin. I mean, there's a lot of back and forth. The, uh, the ideas are very nebulous for the Polish political class. But, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, jo John Godson's been a member of like seven parties. Um, so he had a long history as a lawyer of representing the Polish political class in defamation suits. Anytime there was public criticism, whether it was even in public speaking, uh, if it was in a personal small dynamics, or if it was in print, Roman Gertig would run point to intimidate many free citizens who were criticizing the political class. So I, I noticed that this was going to be, that there was no case here. I wrote on a non-commercial private Facebook page. Facebook is a California incorporated company. I was based in New York at the time. I didn't even say it in Poland. I said it to friends and family and, and to a, and a small group. They made it bigger than it was. So I realized there was no case, but this was a methodology in stifling free expression. And the underlying idea that I was discussing on this procurement is, a, is the integral one. This is coming from my own personal experience running the, running this think tank, that a distinction needs to be made between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. And when government officials dole out overvalued contracts for unnecessary work to their friends, it may not be a violation under the law because the law is codified by those doling out the business. It is certainly, however, a violation of the spirit of law in a constitutional republic of looking out for the citizenry. That's why we elect politicians, to look out for our interests, to uphold the rule of law. And this was a perfect example of abrogation. Now, Sikorsky's got a strong body of work of looting the taxpayer. Here's a guy who has a chauffeur, but he puts in for maximum kilometer allowances on a monthly basis because, hey, it's a little extra cash from the taxpayer. Why not? And that is the mentality. And that is the public criticism that should be galvanized and should be done on a regular basis by an informed citizenry enabled by a media that holds the political class's feet to the fire. But instead in Poland, you don't have that. So that is one of the mechanisms. Another mechanism that is frequently used to undermine free expression is the subversion by design of the mainstream media. Now the mainstream media is a segment that has historically been better funded. Now it's under attack from innovation. This is the, the segment that has utilized conventional distribution mechanisms, and they're trying to migrate their business models to this higher margin, uh, more egalitarian digital realm, and it's very difficult. So because they're having so many problems and Hayekian creative destruction is taking, taking place at, at an- Schumpeterian. Sorry, Schumpeterian, exactly right. Uh, is taking place at, at such a breakneck pace and allowing a plurality of voices to enter the debate, the mainstream press has engaged in a very aggressive and direct uh, methodology of focusing on spinning and determining the agenda and covering up scandal. The scandals that Paprost has written about, that I have written about, the mainstream press is busy A, ignoring it, or B, making apologies and excuses for it. And the media, which has always been aimed in the name of high-minded ideals and social justice, believes that this is their role to further an agenda of socialist or social justice utopia. There's no secret that the media is always been to the left. My father was writing about it. He wrote an essay in 1974, 75, called The Media Shangri-La. I highly encourage all to read this. And it breaks down the Orwellian truths that are spun out in the press of the biggest organs. In America, it's the New York Times. In Poland, it's Gazeta Wyborcza. Uh, and the ability to determine how the politics and the news and the scandals are filtered down to the masses determines how politicians retain power. It is when the masses are sold something, 
Many, a good chunk of the citizenry believes as a fait accompli that what they're getting fed to them because it's in print is legitimate. It's real. If you can touch it, it's contextualized and it's legitimate. And this is something I think that everyone in this room knows. And I think that in America, we're having this debate. In Poland, the debate's been, wa been waged for the last several years very, very aggressively. It's not a secret that this goes on. But the fact that despite that it's not a secret and it goes on to the degree that it does, is absolutely not only baffling, but overwhelming if you're trying to put out ideas, which I'm trying to do with people like Rafael Zimkevich, who writes for Dorecci, is trying to do. Uh, and he's a great example of this using the civil justice system to neuter your opponents, using mechanisms of law. Rafael Zimkevich, he wrote about Adam Micknick in Gazette of Aborcha, how he sues everyone who's critical of him. So he, Adam Micknick, sued. Rafael Zimkevich for saying he sues everyone who's critical of him. And he won. And this was a watershed case. This, 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 was, this, was, this was actually big. But the fact that this is done under the veneer of independence is insidious. It is an effort to convince the consumer and the voter that, is, that what it's being delivered informs rather than manipulates. And the easiest way these leaders of the press manipulate the popular narrative is by omission. They don't report the news that might give their guys a black eye. Last year, the News Weekly Vaprost published transcripts of recordings of Polish politicians engaging in overtly corrupt backroom deals over expensive dinners, a lot of octopus, billed to taxpayers. This had the potential to bring down the entire government by prompting mass resignations and leading to numerous potential criminal charges. The mainstream media machine went into hyperdrive to defend, play down, spin, and protect the principles involved. However, the underlying acts of the scandal, the tape scandal, Afera Tashmova, it was not discussed by any of the major platforms, like Gazette of Aborcha. What was discussed was the privacy violation of the elected and appointed officials for having their quote-unquote rights breached. No mention of our rights as citizens not to get looted by a political class, not to, as a taxpayer, not to be raped fiscally. So by omitting this, they tried to make it a non-story. And nobody was more vociferous in her defense than Ann Applebaum, who is considered a serious journalist and a serious historian. And she writes for Gazette of Aborcha by contribution. She writes for The Telegraph. She writes for The Washington Post. And she went into hyperdrive to defend the majorly implicated players, like her husband. The, she was out there writing about how her poor husband's rights were abrogated. And so obviously, it, it, you know, in an American court of law, her witness would not even be accepted because that is, it's a hearsay. You're not allowed, if you have a personal incentive or a familial connection, to testify on the behalf of someone within your close orbit. Uh, and she is part of the, the, what I call the Gazette of Abortion wine and cheese crowd. There's a lot of social justice, high-minded idealism that drives their motives. And these are people that, that have been warring against the Catholic Church, for instance, which I often say is the strength of Poland's success uh, over the last multiple generations. It kept Poland as a beacon and a bastion of fighting for freedom uh, over many generations when many other Soviet satellites uh, were, were, were succumbed, totally succumbed. And as a result, their economies even have never, never really accelerated as Poles took to freedom and entrepreneurship and the free market like a fish to water. And I, I, I say the Catholic Church had a lot to do with that. And she's part of the crowd that says the Catholic Church is evil and rally, rallies and rants against it. Uh, I mean, to give you an example of how egregious these violations of laws uh, were during a Fera Tashmova, the head of the National Bank of Poland, Marek Belka, the head, it's a constitutionally mandated independent central bank, it cannot coordinate politics, was caught on tape with uh, the interior minister, Bartholomew Sienkiewicz, coordinating monetary policy ahead of the elections. A year out, they were caught discussing keeping rates low, allowing borrowing capacities to expand so that they can swing the election, so they can make sure to, to head off any potential recession that might be brewing on the horizon. This would be something that in a non-banana republic would lead to a jail sentence for Marek Belka. 
I mean, this is he is violent and certainly a, a forced resignation, but most likely a jail sentence because the laws are very clear on this. It's a constitutionally mandated independent central bank, and he was coordinating monetary policy. Uh, and the fact that that conversation was never had in the pages of the paper of record, Gazette of Aborcha, is stunning. It's absolutely stunning. It's also reprehensible that the wife, Ann Applebaum, was also in these pages defending her husband. And the defense time and time again was that their privacy rights were abrogated. And in anticipation of the changing of the guard, they were able to push through legislation providing amnesty to all those caught on the tapes that any evidence called from an illegally procured uh, recording or data point, uh, fact pattern, would be inadmissible in court and they basically gave themselves a, uh, a backdoor amnesty to the crimes that they were well proven to have committed. Uh, I give a lot of respect to Vaprost, which is one of the three big news weeklies, and made itself known that it was not going to be part of this mainstream media cabal. Uh, the owner, Michal Lisiecki, is an independent thinking guy who has owned the paper now for a few years. And when he got the t transcripts of the tapes, he printed them. And it has been no end of lawsuits and civil judgments against him to the tunes of tens of millions of Zlati. It has hurt his business. I imagine that going forward, many of these cases will be vacated. These judgments will be vacated, thankfully, because he did his job as an independent media uh, owner, official, publisher, editor. That is his job to call out criminal activity. More, more, well, one more. more. Yeah, I, I, got some, I got some good stuff here. I, I got some good stuff here. Uh, so in addition to manipulation uh, through omission and spin and defense and coordination, uh, the manufacture and printing of known falsehood and the weaponization of frivolous lawsuits, there exists another method that the mainstream media, the biggest politically connected rent seekers in the media complex in the quote unquote private sector, they dream about this, the bailout. As an investor, this is the one that undermines my faith in an economy the most, whether in the US, the Eurozone, Poland, when a monolithic corporate entity cannot compete or adapt, it withers and dies. This is a good thing, Schumpeterian uh, creative destruction paves the way for new entrance and innovation, new blood brings new ideas and keeps society competitive. But the breakdown in competition that exists in a free market when those who cannot compete begin to get taxpayer subsidies or infusions of capital from the government to stay afloat is unacceptable. By subsidizing one crony's right to express themselves, they crowd out the market for those with other voices, the plurality in a society, from making their voices heard and competing in the free market of ideas. Now, not surprisingly, there's a company in Poland that's been getting bailouts. It's called Agora. Agora is the owner of Gazette of Aborcia, the quote unquote paper of record. Historically, it's been the, uh, the number one paper by daily print run. It is now losing out to two tabloids, uh, one German owned one, one Polish one, Fact and Super Express. This is a good thing. This is creative destruction. People have decided they do not want to be sold lies and it is leading to a Agora bankruptcy but not before Agora has made an excellent backroom deal for itself over the last five years. It turned out in, it was about 18 or 20, 21 months ago, that PZU, PZU, which is the, one of the largest companies in Poland, it's the state-owned enterprise insurance company, and the state still owns 35% of this company. Now, insurance, uh, for anyone who's involved in business, insurance is the best business you can ever be in. It is a way to print money. Uh, Warren Buffett may not be palatable as a political figure, but he's not stupid. His main business is insurance. It prints cash that you can then run off and invest in other businesses. Pizadu has a investment fund, and it turned out that Pizadu was investing in Agora, a dying business. So it was not following the mandate as a fiduciary for the taxpayer and investing in growing businesses, good businesses, businesses that could generate a yield, a return, but it was giving money to the mainstream organ that was protecting and spinning and lying and defending the sca scandal-plagued government. And this came out uh, just under two years ago because they breached a reporting threshold of 5%. So it was actually in the filings. They now own 16%. So it didn't even, so once they announced this, there was a little bit of media coverage, but Agora is not going to write about it. So Super Express wrote about it a little, but there wasn't, and a lot of people didn't understand the degree of breaching fiduciary responsibility that the state-owned insurance company was involved in. Now the state-owned insurance company is loaded with political apparatchiks 
from the incumbent government. So they decided in contravention of their mandate to invest in profitable businesses, that not only would they essentially write them a blank check, and we have no idea what the valuation they paid for on this dying business. If it's anything more than a Zloty, then they're getting killed because the business is worthless. It's going bankrupt. They're losing subscribers and they're hemorrhaging money. They need to get bailed out. So Pizzadu writes a blank check, a valuation we don't know, and doesn't even ask for a board seat. They don't even ask for the right to represent the people's interests because they don't care. This was a way of bailing out their friends. Now, with the new government, I, I think that, that there may be a great inflection in Agora's uh, future, uh, which, uh, which was a, a very, very positive thing. But that level of bailout is so incredibly mind-boggling. It defies all financial and good governance logic. Uh, it appears, because Professor Hodakiewicz is, uh, is breathing down my throat, that I have probably run out of time. My boss. But, <laughs> But there's one other non-media mechanism in play that I think is important, especially coming from this post-communist period in Poland's history. And that's the way that public institutional administration and the management of the trappings of political power, those who have control of the ministries, of the government, have a lot of power to lash out at their enemies. So they take away what is not theirs to bestow in the first place, which is the rights of a free citizen in a free country, a republic, to tap into the offerings of government. The act of forceful censorship that exists when a government apparatchik, when the head of a ministry or an emissary of a ministry, when an elected or an appointed official, when they take away the rights of free citizens to tap in to what the government offers the citizenry, this is an act of forceful censorship and it is as brazenly anti-democratic as the bailout. And I can highlight this with a personal example. Last year, the Consul General of the Consul, uh, Polish Consulate in New York blacklisted me from the Polish Consulate in New York. Now, I'm a, a resident of New York, I'm a Polish citizen. Some might even argue that I add a little bit to the discourse of debate and, and thought in public, public life, public, public and intellectual life. So she took something that she had no right, this was not hers to bestow, as I had never been violent. I, I might have said, made a few wise ass comments, but I had never been violent, I never caused a commotion. Uh, but she told her staff that I am no longer welcome and beautifully, because these people have been engaging power for so long with the communist mentality of stepping on people's throats, they don't think about their actions, they sent me an email that I'm no longer welcome. I was supposed to go to an event uh, that was hosted by another organization, the Pazutski Institute, uh, that was being held at the consul, and my invitation was rescinded 24 hours before with an email saying, you're no longer welcome here, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. This was the greatest gift they ever gave me because this allowed me to highlight this incredible point of this operatic class taking away what is not theirs to bestow. In fact, uh, if anybody uh, Googles inappropriate abuse of power at the Polish consulate, there's a video about this subject. I also am on the board of an undercover journalism nonprofit called Project Veritas, headed by a revolutionary young man named James O'Keefe. Uh, he's, he's causing a revolution. Uh, and in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, he went up to her with me hiding behind a bush and filming uh, with his phone on record, because this is what he does, and asked, why did you ban my friend Matthew Tierman from the Polish consulate? Uh, and she said, he's not banned, he can come. And then I flashed to the email that says, you're no longer welcome there, it's an excellent dichotomy. And, uh, and then she actually goes off in an unhinged rant about if somebody comes to your home and insults you, would you invite them back? And that's exactly the point. These people think the trappings of political power are theirs. The consul was her home. In my view, she's an appointed administrator who at best is a cultural liaison. More likely, she signs a few things, she cuts a few ribbons, but she does not have the right to blacklist those she doesn't like for political reasons. And of course, it's a political reasoning behind it. Uh, so it's... Uh, to me, that is one of the great examples of stifling free expression. You have to kind of leap from direct free expression 
to indirect free expression. And the indirect free expression is, as a citizen, to be able to engage the state, the state apparatus and all of its good, positive, and negative dynamics. And being banned from the, the Polish consulate, I think, uh, illustrates a lot of the way the political class operates. When you see that they'll ban people they don't like from a Polish consulate, then you also make sense. It's, you see that they will also bail out their friends in bankrupt media entities, or they'll sue critics of them uh, in a court of law because, again, they come from a mentality of engaging power. Even if they were communist opposition, they come from a background of we know how to engage power and it's by stepping on the necks of those we disagree with and avoiding debate at all costs. Because like Ann Applebaum, who has banned me from her Twitter feed, not surprisingly, uh, these people, despite their high-minded, quote-unquote, egalitarian and sophisticated elite academic ideals, they abhor debate. Their ideas do not hold up to debate. So instead of debate, they make sure to silence and stifle those others' free expression. I mean, I, the list of, uh, the, of PO uh, ministers whose Twitters I've been banned for is pretty instructive. Uh, there's quite a few of them. Uh, Rostovsky, who nationalized the pensions. He's not a fan of... My, uh, my pros, uh, Ann Applebaum, Radoslav Sikorsky, and these are people who say we're Western educated, we're academic elites, and we believe in high-minded egalitarian values, but they do not practice what they preach. And it's good that a lot of people, both in Poland and even people that historically would have shifted to sort of that left of center mentality they had, they're seeing it and they're running from it. And I think that there is an inflection going on in Poland. Uh, there's certainly a little bit of a, uh, a, a socio-political power vacuum uh, in culture and ideas that is, I think, accelerating right now. We'll see what fills it. I'm certainly a little nervous about it. Uh, but I did endorse the last government. Be, uh, in their electoral uh, process for the simple reason that for eight years, P.O. ran the country and they used it as a, uh, a piggy bank. They looted it and they used the media to protect themselves, to stifle criticism. And I always say, I say this in Poland all the time when I speak, politicians are like baby's diapers. They need to be changed often, otherwise the place begins to smell like you know what. So I do think we have a great inflection. I'm um, cautiously optimistic that having vanquished the looter class, Poland will be able to move toward an expanded prosperity. Uh, I believe that a plurality of views and high turnover in government is how prosperity can accelerate. So I do think Poland is moving in a good direction. Uh, and what I discussed in deconstructing these, these complexes and mechanisms uh, is a little bit backward looking. It may be a little dated as of October 25th. I hope that's the case. We shall see. Now, open for questions. What a great speech exposing corporate uh, welfare. And cronyism on all levels, cronyism, not just corporate cronyism, yeah. just political I just cronyism. I to say that uh, I know What's Anna. That? I need to learn Polish first. <laughs> or sign language. Yeah, well, I know a few signs. I know Anna Applebaum. I work with her. Sometimes I work very closely with her. I would expect my wife to defend me no matter what. Yes, but printing it on the pages of the paper of record and then my saying it's blameless. My wife is a blameless. New York lawyer. Yeah, well, she should protect you then. You might need it. Yes, thank you for having invited you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very Any much. Any questions? Thank you very much. Do you want a question? Yeah, I want a question. We have, well, Miss, Mrs. Bridges, do you mind staying a little bit longer? Oh, yeah. Um, I was going to switch the video camera. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Oh, one very quick question. Was it Eva Yunchik Giometska or Ushka Agasa who banned you? No, it was Eva Yunchik Giometska. Yeah. Yeah, I can spell it out if you need Z-I-O-M-E-C-K-A. Okay. Charming woman. <laughs> yes. On her days off. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned about the First Amendment and the American Constitution. There's a talk about upgrading, uh, updating Polish Constitution. How would you encourage Polish politicians, you know him, to include that in the country? Yeah, no, I, I think that's what I, I, I've had conversations with a lot of the new Polish government, and I've said repeatedly as I speak about publicly all the time, that for Poland to really expand its democracy, for it to evolve into a better, stronger, more vibrant 
democracy. This is the absolute predicate. Freedom of, uh, total unfettered freedom of expression. No such thing as hate speech. So the left of center guys who call themselves right of center guys, uh, Platformo Vitelska, hate speech was anything, you know, anti-immigrant and you're a racist, a bigot. You weren't allowed to talk about it. You were a pariah. Now, the right of center guys who've taken over, they want to determine, uh, make a determinative hate speech if you bash the church. Well, personally, I believe that none of these things are ban bannable speech. Whether you think they're hate speech or not, hate speech is in the eyes of the beholder. I think Ann Applebaum and Radoslav Sikorsky are frauds. They call that hate speech. I think that's my opinion. So, I mean, it's totally in the eyes of the beholder. I'm sorry, Mark. Give her my regards, please. I will. Thank you. Axel Springer, yeah. They own Fact, the number one newspaper by circulation, tabloid. One, and, and so Those Super Express is gaining on them. Where do they fit in this whole thing? You know, my, my partner in crime, uh, crime, uh, Michal Lyshetsky, who owns uh, The Prost, he talks a lot about German ownership of the media and foreign ownership of the media. The media being such a uh, strategically and systemically important institution for the very reason of holding government and public life and those in public life accountable. I personally believe, I'm a, I'm a libertarian economist, I believe in the free market, I believe that competitive interests have a right to ha engage in cross-border transactions. Uh, I have not seen that much pejorative activity out of Axel Springer beyond sometimes ignoring the uh, judgments against them for defamation for what they print. Uh, I don't view it as that poisoned, but only if Polish industry can compete on a fair and level playing ground. And in Poland, and this is a whole nother debate, the preferential tax treatment and different set of laws is a double standard on how businesses are treated. Domestic businesses, mom and pop who owns the sklep on the corner versus Biedronka and Tesco who don't pay taxes. Uh, that creates an anti-competitive and non-level playing field. So that's where I think if you level that playing field, Polish industry, Polish entrepreneurs would be able to compete. I'm looking at Polish media. It's pretty now getting pretty robust thanks to digital distribution. The barriers to entry are low. The right of center, Nieza Lezhna, Vipolitice, uh, there's a whole lot of outlets gaining traction in the Polish media complex on merit because they can compete without having, having to resort to protectionism because the distribution mechanisms are so much cheaper. So I believe that in competition you get great, great, great uh, outcomes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Next time that we'll be standing